Good evening. Let's all stand together. Sing these hymns together this evening. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a take our evening tithes and offering. I want to ask Brother John Graves if he would to bless the offering.
Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise for his grace, his mercy. Dear Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, God. We thank you that we can come to you however we are, Lord. However sinful we may have been, Lord, you're there and you're willing to forgive us if we just come to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to have you here for our Sunday evening services. I know we've got several visitors. We certainly welcome all of you to our services this evening. We've got a special ceremony that we're going to hold here in just a little bit as Miss Phoenix is going to be baptized, and we're excited about her decision for Christ. Uh, if you will, if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12, we're going to be looking at just a couple of verses this evening in verses 42 and 43 of John chapter 12. I want to give you a little bit of a background of what we're going to be looking at here because we're just going to take a little snippet of scripture and so we want to understand how that kind of fits in the whole narrative. We're in the book of John so that means we're studying, looking at the life of Jesus Christ and his ministry here on earth. And he's been teaching a crowd of people. He's been speaking about his impending crucifixion. John actually tells us just shortly before this that the voice of God speaks down from heaven. And there were people that were sort of debating as to, well, we think that was probably thunder. And there are always people who are going to be try to explain away the working of God here on earth. But some people are dismissing it and, and other people are trying to figure out what's going on. Everyone's curious about Jesus and they're here to hear what he has to say. They want to see what it is that he might do next. And there's a particular group of people that are in the crowd that Jesus is speaking to. And we find what I believe is one of the most sobering moments recorded in all the Bible. I want you to look at these two verses with me, verses 42 and 43 of John chapter 12. The Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, there are a couple of groups of people that are referenced here in this passage, and we need to understand who they are and the dynamic working between them to really get a grasp of what we're reading here. You've got a couple of groups of people that are mentioned. The first are the chief rulers, the chief rulers. Most Bible scholars believe that this group represented some of the local political officials of that area. They may have been... Uh, mayors or, or, or different council members of some of the local communities around. Most people would have recognized their face. They would have interacted with them and understood that these were people of power and authority, at least locally, maybe not on a grand scale in the Roman Empire who was in power in that area at the time. But they were rulers. They were important people. People looked up to them and looked at them, examined their lives. Then we have another group of people, and that's the Pharisees. Now, we tend to, as we read the Gospels, associate the Pharisees as being the quote-unquote bad guys of the Gospel. These were the men who opposed Jesus' teaching. And these were the men who would be responsible for putting Jesus to death. So they were, in effect, bad guys. But we have to understand that in that day, at that moment, they were considered the elite religious authority of the day. So everyone would have looked up to these men. They may have considered them spiritual heroes, if you will. And these men, though they weren't the political rulers, they exerted a tremendous amount of influence and power, especially among the Jewish citizens of that region. Now, as we go back and we understand what John is telling us here, we see that the chief rulers, the political guys of the area, many of that group that were in the crowd that day listening to Jesus, they believed what Jesus was saying. And if you study Jesus' teaching, you understand that he's consistently talking about the fact that he is the Son of God. He says in another place that no man comes unto the Father but by him. And so these individuals are putting their faith and their understanding that Jesus is telling them the truth. 
The Bible says they believed on him, but they wouldn't confess him. Well, that's a real problem because the Bible tells us that there are a couple of things necessary and required of us in order to be right with God, in order to accept Jesus as our Savior. We have to believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and we must confess him with our mouth. So these men are right on the verge of getting right with God. They are right on the verge of knowing Jesus as their Savior. They're on the, on the precipice, on the cusp, so close. But John records that these men, though they believed what Jesus said was the truth, they would not confess him. Yeah. And I want to ask you a question this evening, and I don't intend to take very long, but I want to share this thought with you tonight, and maybe it's something that we can all chew on and take home with us this evening. I want to ask you the question, what's keeping you from Jesus? Amen. What is keeping you from Amen. Jesus. Now, that question applies to different ones of us in the room in different ways. There may be some in the room that there are some circumstances in your life that are keeping you from even putting faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight, and there are things keeping you from putting your faith in him and trusting him as your Savior. For others in the room, maybe you have accepted Christ as Savior. And I imagine at church on Sunday night, the bigger part of the crowd probably has. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some factors that are keeping you from following Jesus as closely as you should. Just last Sunday morning, we talked about how Jesus gives us the option and presses us with the choice of choosing what path in life we're to live. Am I going to live to please God or am I going to live to please myself? This morning, we talked about what sort of the guides and spiritual guides and Bible teachers we're going to choose to listen to and the influence and impact they will have on us as we walk that path. And the Bible is constantly challenging us to draw closer to God to surrender to him. And so maybe tonight you know Jesus, but you're not as close as you ought to be. I believe as we look at these two verses, we're gonna find three factors this evening that are keeping some people from accepting Jesus as Savior and keeping others from following as closely as they should. And we're gonna look at them closely and quickly for just a few moments this evening. What three things kept these men from Jesus? Number one was their position their position. The Bible tells us here that these men were the chief rulers. And I've already explained that chief rulers probably references those who were in some amount of political authority. We don't know, again, just how far up the ladder in the political scheme of things these men might have been, but they had some amount of influence, some amount of authority. And with influence and authority come some perks. It's one of the reasons that so many people strive to try to get into politics today because of all the perks that they can enjoy from be, having that sort of influence and that sort of power. And so these men would have had influence and power and there I'm sure would have been perks as a result of taking care of their friends and looking out for others. And if they confessed Jesus, then that was potentially gonna upset that entire apple cart for them. If they accepted Jesus, if they confessed him publicly where everyone knew whose side they were on, then that may have been really, really bad for business. Amen. And so these guys decide, man, he's telling the truth, but oh, we can't align with him. We can't accept him. We can't let others know that we think he is telling the truth. By this point in Jesus' ministry, he's already a controversial figure especially as it relates to the Jewish faith. Man, the Pharisees have already aligned themselves against him and they're already beginning to try to influence others to, 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 to not listen to what he has to say and to dismiss him as a lunatic. And so he's already become a controversial figure. And so if they align themselves with him, then they are inviting all of that controversy onto themselves. And they decided that their position was more important 
than Jesus. Now, you may be thinking, well, how in the world does that apply to me? I'm not an important political figure. I'm not someone with uh, a large amount of influence in a, in a society or in my, you know, in my, even in my, maybe even my neighborhood. You know, I'm not even on the, uh, uh, what is it, the, the local neighborhood watch or whatever. I, I don't have any influence. What kind of position are you talking about here? Well, the position that I want to suggest that may be keeping some from Jesus or others from following him as they should is the perception of what other people think of you in your position. I can remember the first time that I ever shared this particular uh, thought with anyone. I was talking to young people. And I can remember as a young person at six years of age, I made a profession of faith in Christ. But my mother was the one who prayed the prayer. She was a young Christian. She didn't really know what she was doing and how to lead somebody to Christ. And she prayed the prayer and I didn't pray anything. And I knew very quickly afterward that I wasn't any more right with God than the man in the moon. But my family had been going to church there for several years. And the older I got, the more people just knew who I was. I was kind of like the, uh, the paint on the wall. I, would just, I just hung around. I was there all the time. I assumed that everyone else assumed that I was right with God and that I knew Jesus as my Savior. And so it wasn't until I was 13 at a camp preacher was preaching on hell the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and I knew very clearly I needed to make a decision for Christ Amen. and let me say that was a humbling experience for me because I knew other people would think well I thought he was his position maybe tonight maybe tonight you've been part of a church for years and if you were to admit that you weren't what you seem to be, then what would other people think of you? That's exactly what these men are going through here in John. And they decided the position was more important. And it was a convenient choice for the moment. In that moment, that was the easiest choice. But I believe if we could speak to those men in eternity right now, they would say, oh, that I had the opportunity to go back and swallow my pride so that I might be right with Jesus. And I wonder if there may be some of us in the room this evening that that's what we need to do. We need to lay aside a perceived position. No, we may not be some great political official, but that doesn't mean that we may not think in our minds that we've got some position that we need to keep up in front of people. And if we finally admit we aren't who we claim to be, then that will be embarrassing. Lay that aside. Who cares? The moment after this life is over, what everybody else thinks of you won't matter a bit. The only thing that will matter the moment after you take your last breath is what God Almighty thinks. Amen. And so we need to make sure that we're concerned about being right with him. So three things that kept these men from Jesus. The first is position. The second is peer pressure. Peer pressure. Now, a lot of times peer pressure is an idea that we tend to ascribe to the young people. They have to deal with peer pressure. Kids are, uh, you know, they're, they're pressured into trying alcohol or drugs or cigarettes and all these things because they, they want to keep up with the crowd and they want their friends to think they're cool and they don't want to be, you know, seen as weird or, or, or you know, not out, out of step with, with, with what's going on in their day. And so they, they give in to peer pressure. They deal with peer pressure. But I would submit that you never outgrow the influence of peer pressure. Wanting other people to think well of you. Being concerned with the way other people perceive you. We are still concerned. Oh, maybe not as much as when we were teenagers. Maybe not as much as that group on the back row there right now. But we're still concerned about it. It still matters to us. It matters to these guys. The Bible tells us that they wouldn't confess Christ because of the Pharisees. I've already explained who the Pharisees are in this passage. They were the men of religious authority and religious influence. And to be out with those guys was bad for business. Yeah. 
So the peer pressure of the Pharisees kept these men from Jesus. We've all given in to peer pressure at some time in our life. Remember, I was a, a little boy. I was probably seven, eight, nine, somewhere along in there. Maybe 10. My wife says everything that happened to me that I tell stories about when I was a kid happened when I was 10 years old. So I was probably 10. She's probably right. I had a buddy, and my name is, well, my name is James, but I go by Zach. And his name was Zachary, and he went by Zach. He's a year older than I, and Zachary was a bad influence on me. Zachary was constantly after me to try to do things that we weren't sure were okay for us to do. My family and I lived in a two-story home, kind of down in a, a little, you know, ravine area, bottom area, went down a little hill, and there was a creek down by our home, and at that time, now there's a big highway that goes pretty close back by that house, but it went on out into the woods. And for two young boys, before all the digital devices came into the world, that sounded like fun. Now you can hardly get a kid to go out into the woods, right? But back then, man, that was a playground. So Zach loved to come to my house because of all the woods. And so we got permission from my parents to go down, play at the creek, and uh, we played down there for a little while, but after a while, that, that wasn't so much fun. And we wanted to go a little further, and Zach kept saying, well, let's just keep going, let's just keep going. And, and I'm thinking, man, we're getting further and further away from the house, but they did say we could go down here. And we, we kept going until we got to what's called the Little River. And it's a little river, but it's still enough river to get drowned in. We were a good ways from my parents' house, a long way off. We couldn't see it, they couldn't see us. We were having a good time playing down by the river, and then off in the distance, I could hear someone. You know, it, 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 you heard this, you've experienced this before, when you can hear a very faint noise, but you know it's just someone screaming a long way away. And it was my mother's voice screaming my name. And I knew in that moment I had made a very big mistake. And Zach and I began to run as fast as our little legs could carry us back to my house. And my dad, my mom, my grandmother, my brother, my sister, they're frantically looking for us, calling our name. And we get back there and everyone but my dad goes back in the house. As a matter of fact, that would have been, oh man, 35 years ago. I was talking to Zach, the other person in the story, just a couple of months ago. And we brought up what happened that day. It le he left an impression on us in more ways than one. Uh, and we never did that again. Never did that again. Why? Why did I end up down at the river? I never went down there on my own. Never went by myself. And I had to pay the price. Why? Because of peer pressure. Peer pressure. Peer pressure will make us do some dumb things. And I'm afraid... Peer pressure may even be keeping some from Jesus even now. Amen. Worried about what other people may think. Worried about how other people may view you. Maybe you, God's been calling, speaking to your heart about something and, and stepping out in faith and doing something for him. But you know, others may you know, think you're trying to be super spiritual or trying to be weird or trying to act better than everybody else. Whatever God's calling you to do, are you allowing peer pressure to keep you from God's best in your life. Three things kept these men from Jesus. Same three factors that can keep us from Jesus today. Keep some of us from ever knowing him as our savior and those that do keep us from following him as we should. The first was position. The second was peer pressure. And thirdly and finally was pride. Pride. If you look at verse 43, John ends this little two verse statement and thought by saying, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Amen. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. These men had achieved what they saw as an important status in life. And they were rulers. They were somebody. I mean, maybe they came from families who were nobodies. Maybe they came from poor families and now they're wealthy. 
people who didn't have anything and looked down at them and, and now they're people who have something and they have means and others respect them and, and as a result, they began to feel pretty good about themselves and what they had achieved in life. And they knew that if they sided with Jesus, that that was going to go away. And it was going to pierce and ruin their pride. And their pride kept them from Jesus. We should never let pride keep us from accepting Jesus or from following him the way that we know he should. I've shared this story before, but it fits here, so I'm going to share it again. Um, Reagan's getting ready to go to Southeastern Friday. She's going to leave a little Bible college, Free Will Baptist Bible College in Wendell, North Carolina. And when I was a young person, I grew up about an hour from that college, and our pastor was the chairman of the board, and so they were constantly coming there to recruit young people to attend Southeastern College, just a small Bible college. At the time, it ran like 120 students, very small. But their little singing group would get up on our platform and they'd sing. And ah, man, that was all I wanted to do with my life. The thought of being on the Southeastern Ensemble. And then within the ensemble, that's a mixed group of young men and young ladies, there was a men's quartet. And by, to you, I know this sounds so ridiculous, but in my little world at the moment, that was just, just the height of all I could ever achieve was to be in that quartet. And so I ended up going to Southeastern. I tried out for the ensemble and made the ensemble. My wife and I sang in the ensemble together, tried out for the quartet, made the quartet, sang the lead in the quartet for three years. My third year, I'm in the quartet and I've been singing, we've been traveling. We actually recorded a couple of little albums that we took with us when we traveled and sold. Among those churches in that area, we'd travel and, and you'd, you'd go to, to churches where uh, people would tell you, oh, you're, you, you sing so well, your group sounds so good, you're so talented. And at the time, I, I thought that was a big deal. I look back now and realize that it was all very elderly people who were telling me this and they probably couldn't hear very well. And they were just trying to be kind. I mean, that's the truth. they were trying to be kind, but I took it as more than that. Boy, I thought I was, so, if you think that I think I'm something now, you should have met me when I was 20. <laughs> I was a mess. I was full of pride. And I can remember we were at a missions conference and our quartet was going to sing. We were going to sing the last song right before the message and this missionary from had been living in some other country is going to speak to the crowd. And there were hundreds of people there, I don't know, maybe close to a thousand. It was, it was a large crowd, a large group and and I was the featured soloist for the song. And we'd sung that song dozens of times. And at the end, there's a bridge. And at the bridge, I took another little solo and ended on this high, majestic note. And it was beautiful until that day. <laughs> I did not know. Found out after the fact that they'd had the piano tuned just before the conference. And the tuner had inadvertently tuned the piano two steps higher than they should have tuned it. Now, for those of you who are musicians or vocalists, you understand that's a real problem. But I didn't know it. And so we start singing, and I thought it felt a little high. But I assumed I was just, you know, it's just my mind playing tricks on me. I was a little nervous. It was a bigger crowd than we usually sang to. And we got to the bridge of the song. And I tried to hit that note. But at that point, it was far beyond my capacity and range to be able to hit, and I didn't know it. So I went for that note, and those of you that have remembered me telling the story before, it sounded much like what those of you who remember Tarzan, the ape man, <laughs> his jungle yell. It's pretty much what it sounded like. Because I tried to hit it, and I cracked, but I thought, I can still get it, and I went for it again, and it just got worse. We finished the song. I mean, we were, we were just a couple of lines from the end of the song. We finished the song, and you can see people snickering, and folks' faces are turning red because they're so embarrassed for me. And I thought about it. I really did. I had to go out. It was, it was in a gymnasium much like this. I had to go out. My then fiance, now wife, Hope, was sitting over on this side, 
I had to walk out through the hallway, and it seriously crossed my mind to just go out the front door, get in my car, drive away from North Carolina, and never return. Find a new life somewhere else. That's how embarrassed. That's how embarrassed I was. I was so embarrassed. Oh, I was ruined. I can remember coming in the back doors, and my, my fiance Hope is sitting over here, and, and when my wife gets tickled, I mean really, really tickled, she's not, when I laugh, people in other counties can hear me laugh when I get tickled, but my wife is the opposite. She gets very quiet, but she just kind of heaves a little bit, just kind of bounces a little bit, and I'll never forget, I can remember walking in the back door, and this is, this is her. She's trying not to. She's trying not to. And I sit down beside her, and, and I said, don't say anything. Don't say anything. And I don't remember a word that the missionary said that day. I'm sure it was probably a wonderful message. But I don't remember a word that the missionary said that day because I was so convicted about my pride. There's no doubt in my mind, looking back on that moment, that that moment was for one person in that room, for me. Because I needed to be given a moment, an opportunity to reflect on the pride in my heart and mind. And I'll say this, it's a lesson I'm still trying to learn. Thank the Lord up to now, he hasn't ever taught me a lesson quite that embarrassing, but it's still something that I'm learning. Pride. Is pride keeping you from Jesus? Is pride keeping you from accepting him? Is pride keeping you from surrendering all that you have, all that you are to him? What is God speaking to your heart and mind about? Is there something that you have been recently seemingly challenged from his word and yet you resist? Why? Probably one of the root causes is one of the three things we discussed from John 12, 42, and 43 either position, peer pressure, or pride. James 4, 6, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. God wants you to know him in his fullness. He wants you to follow him closely. He wants to meet your needs. He wants to use you in a mighty way in your sphere of influence. He wants to be all that his word promises he will be for you if you will trust him. But if that's going to happen in our lives, we've got to get past these problems keeping us from him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what we've considered tonight from your word really sobering thought here that John shares with us. Just two short verses. If we're reading quickly, we don't even pay attention to what we just read. But men who believed what you had to say, and yet they never made it right with you from what we know because of their position, their pride, and their peer pressure. Lord, I pray you'd help us to identify what it may be going on in our own hearts and minds. It may be keeping us from you. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to repent, turn to you, and surrender, faith, repentance. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We're not going to take long, but while the music plays softly this evening, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart and mind maybe about something that we've discussed this evening from his word, maybe about something totally unrelated. I want to give you an opportunity to respond. We've got a couple of, we've got an altar down here at the front, space down here across the front of the platform. If the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, I want to encourage you to come. We're not going to take long, but if God is dealing with you, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to what you may be sensing in your own mind and heart this evening. So I'm going to stop talking for a moment. And while I do, in the stillness of the moment, if the Holy Spirit's dealing with your heart and mind, I want to encourage you to come.
Father, we pray that you help us to be honest with ourselves and honest with you. And if your Holy Spirit is speaking to our minds and hearts about some factor in our lives that's preventing us from being all you'd have us to be, maybe preventing us from even knowing you, Lord, we pray that you do the work that only you can do. We pray that as we walk out these doors this evening, that you'll continue to convict and continue to challenge us. And may we respond to your will for our lives. If there's any here that don't know you as their personal Savior, we pray, Lord, that they come to know you. That they surrender their selves and they repent of their sins and turn to you in faith. And for those of us who do know you, Lord, maybe we aren't as close as we should be. Maybe we haven't surrendered the way that you'd have us to. Maybe you're dealing with us, speaking to us about something in particular that we've been putting off and pushing to the side. Lord, we pray that you'd help us as well, convict us, and help us to be willing to commit and surrender whatever it is that you may be dealing with us about as well. Lord, we love you. We, are play, we pray your blessing on the rest of this service. We ask these things in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Amen. You can look this way. Well, thank you so much for coming this evening. We now have uh, a special time here in our service, and we're going to have a baptism. We've got one young lady who is going to be baptized tonight. And uh, I'm going to ask Miss Phoenix if she would make her way up here, honey. Uh, just while she's making her way up here, I think most of us are probably familiar uh, with baptism and what it means. And we've already talked to, talked with Miss Phoenix. Yes, ma'am, you come right back here, and I'm going to help you up these steps, okay? And then you're going to get in the water. You're good? Can I help you? All right. There you go. Is it all right? Does it feel okay? Good. Why don't you have a seat right there? Can you sit down right there? There you go. Put your feet in the bottom. All right. There we go. So, baptism. Baptism. We understand and talked to Phoenix recently about this. Baptism does not save anyone. Baptism, though, is the opposite of what we've been talking about tonight. It's someone who's accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and is saying publicly, I'm on his side. And that's what little Phoenix is doing this evening. She accepted Christ some time back, was talking about baptism with Jim and Melinda, and then they asked us about baptism. And so I met with Jim and with Phoenix a couple of weeks ago and talked to her and it was very clear she understood that she'd accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. She knew what that meant. She understood what baptism meant. And that from what Melinda was even saying, she's been telling other people. Was well, if the hairdresser said, hey, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Do you know him too? And that's, that's, that's what God wants of us. And so we're thankful for Phoenix and her putting her faith in Jesus and excited about the future for her that she follows him. All right, Miss Phoenix, I'm going to show you what you're going to do. You're going to pinch your nose, and then you're going to hold your breath, and I'm just going to lean you back in the water and bring you back up, okay? I won't keep you down there long, okay? It'll just be for a moment, okay? Hang on just a second. Here we go. Ready? Heavenly Father, because Phoenix has accepted you as her, her Savior and Lord, Lord, we thank you for the decision that she's made, and we now baptize this, our sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here we go. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Congratulations. Congratulations, honey. Let me help you up. Well done. You good? Well done. Here's the steps over here. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Let's give her a hand one more time. Congratulations, Miss Phoenix. It should always be an encouragement when young people accept Christ as Savior and then are willing to make that step. A lot of times that can be intimidating for a, a young one to be in front of everyone in a church service and have all eyes on them. So we're so grateful for Phoenix's decision and look forward to what God's going to be doing with her life as she continues to grow and love and serve him. We're gonna be dismissed in a word of prayer here in just a moment, but I do wanna let you know that I think I saw some refreshments set up in here. So, man, if you came this morning, you get a double dip. I mean, refreshments after Sunday morning church, refreshments after Sunday night church. Maybe we should just start a sign-up sheet and just do refreshments after every service, you know? 
Um, anyway, glad that you came tonight. Thanks so much to all of you that are visiting this evening and came out to support Phoenix. We so appreciate you being here and uh, glad to have everyone here this evening. Why don't we go ahead and stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Phoenix. Thank you for these that have come to visit, many of those who represent additional spiritual influences in her life. We thank you for their faithfulness to you. Lord, as I reflect on my own life as a young man, so grateful for people who poured into me so that I would accept you as a young person. And so, Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do in Phoenix's life, the lives that you will touch through her life. We pray for Jim and Melinda and Ashley as they care for her and raise her. Lord, may she prioritize for the rest of her life knowing, serving, and following you. Lord, we pray for everyone in the service this evening. As we go out this week, we'll be mindful of our influence around those that we touch and come into contact with. And may we be bold witnesses for you. Bless the refreshments and the time of fellowship. We love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thanks so much for coming this evening.